I want to thank you all for attending today. I'll speak briefly about the YWCA and then give the floor to Diane. I'm Michelle Williamson with the YWCA. Um, so first I'd like to share with you the mission of the YWCA. The YWCA Missoula is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. If you're interested in learning more about the YWCA, we host monthly tours that you um, are more than welcome to attend. We have cards that look exactly like this over here on the table with the cookies and tea. Um, and it, it includes information on how to RSVP for those if you wanted to learn more about the Y. The Brown Bag Lunch Discussion Series is a component of the YWCA's Women, Women's, Economic Advance, Women's Economic Advancement Initiative. The nine-part lecture series features women discussing topics that impact women. Um, so, let's get started with today's topic. This event will be videotaped by Missoula Community Access Television as part of its Media Assistance Grants Program to nonprofit organizations. For more information about the grant program, please contact MCAT at 542-6228. Um, Diane Sands has spent decades as a historian of Montana women. Her current projects include the Committee for Celebration of the Centennial of Montana Women's Suffrage and placement of a women's his history mural in the, the state capitol, which was passed by legislature this year in 2011. I'll let her talk to you more about the subject while we're all here today. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so Thank much, you Michelle. Me. And Michelle has a sign-in sheet, but if any of you are interested in helping in some way or another knowing more about uh, the plans that we're developing across the state for the celebration of the centennial of women's suffrage in my end uh, which will be in 2014. so we're working on the right so sign up i'll start passing that around so look for it thank you so i'm always happy to be here for the why nice to see so many friends and a handful of you that i don't know and thank you and Kat, for televising this um, I'm here primarily as a historian, even though I am a legislator and a political person by nature, I guess, as many of you are that I know in this audience. Um, I spent a lot of years doing women's history of a lot of different topics, and it's interesting that there's so little written about women in Montana political history, and I'm not still quite sure why that is. We were talking about having a reading list, but frankly, there really isn't anything that you don't get to read, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, so you write your book? Yeah, yeah, I've got a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> but, so first of all, let me talk to you about uh, what I think the purpose of history is, especially for a story in this case. The stories of history are really very important, I think, to all of us, because they do things such as they inspire us, they ground us in um, the history of the past, they're a yardstick to measure how much progress we've made. They're a tool to learn from in terms of the strategies of what works and doesn't work. So they're an analytical tool. There are many different kinds of things. There are also, as Napoleon once said, one of my favorite, history is a myth agreed upon. <laughs> and the traditional myth in history has been that women really haven't done anything. They're not very interesting anyway because they just do ahistorical things like stay home and take care of kids. So we have to pay much attention to them. And the very few that we do pay attention to Sort of the, I call them the great white mothers here, and when you get to political history, are few and far between. And of course, we have a very famous one in Montana, Jeanette Rankin. And um, the way she has often been portrayed is, in many ways, as I call it, the great white mother sort of syndrome, which is that none of us would ever relate to her saying, well, Betty Wing is a Jeanette Rankin, and you know, you're a Jeanette Rankin, and you're a Jeanette Rankin. Well, we're all Jeanette Rankins. And the fact of the matter is, history does not happen by individual people solely, it's always in the context of larger groups and in fact movements. We make history happen, we make change happen, and it happens because large groups of people move history in certain directions. History doesn't happen to us, we make history. So I'm a big advocate of history as a political tool, if you want to say that. It doesn't mean that it's not objective, whatever the heck that means, but that we look at history through certain lenses and uh, so I'm going to look through uh, the lens of 
women's history and political participation and roles in Montana history. And I would really say, keep in mind as we go through this, that it's still my contention, and I believe it certainly is the wise and probably most of yours, that we live in a representative democracy, and it is both our right, and I'm going to talk a lot about the natural right of citizens to participate in our government, as opposed to women participating in government because we're special, because we have a special nature. So the fundamental argument is still playing out today, and it's just fascinating. So, in 2010, it will be the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. This is not women's suffrage, it's always said that way, but it is women's suffrage. Because the argument was, if even one woman wanted to vote, it was her right. It was her right to participate in government. <coughs> it is technically women's suffrage, they're not suffragettes, it's suffrage. Suffragette is sort of, as the British term, it's sort of like calling you a bra burner as a women's liberate. It's uh, demeaning in that regard. So the correct terms are suffrage and woman suffrage. Um, so as we start to look at how suffrage happened, I think it's important to look at, so what did it mean? Where have we come in this last hundred years? And um, there are many things I could say about this, but we don't have an entire course to do this in, but I'm going to give you a few snapshots. Um, so again, this is um, not just going to be about individuals, but about movements and groups. So let's start with before 1914. So I'm going to go back more than 100 years. When um, women in the 19th century, 18th century, I guess it was 1900s, early or 1800s, were uh, coming to the West, um, not Native Americans, I'm not really talking about Native Americans except a couple of individuals here, they had a very different legal and social context than what any of you today have ever been around or can, I think in many ways, ever really understand. Women were not legally persons under the law, because of the Blackstone law. Married women were considered to be under the cover of their husbands, and that one was the husband, and that was based in the Bible, the husband mm -hmm. one for one. And so uh, most women could not own property, they could not own businesses, they could not enter into contracts, and they could not even be guardians of their own children because they were not a legal person. Um, the women uh, were expected to live, particularly middle-class women, in this idealized Victorian private sphere of the home and family, and it is an idealization because, of course, many women were working women and worked outside the home. You've got African-Americans as slaves. You've got the, ma the majority job for women who are employed is as domestic servants, and that's the case until 1940. So there are many women out working who don't comply with this idealized, but it was um, it was the image that women were presented with, expected to try to live up to. Um, this is home and family, and this was seen as women's nature. This is a natural role, and men's role was in the public sphere of work and politics. And this was truly seen as one's nature, and to step outside of it was considered unnatural, such as the abolitionist sisters, the Grimke sisters, speaking in public, speaking not just to women, but to promiscuous gatherings of men and women. The churches in particular went absolutely crazy. There were riots. People were bombed for actually speaking in public. So when you get to Montana, there's a very famous case <coughs> that, you read that you will enjoy. And this is um, a letter you've probably never heard about. Now, many of you know who Frank Linderman was, a very famous Montana writer, did a lot of work on the Crow. He is the man that Jeanette Rankin defeated in 1916 when she uh, ran for Congress. Now think about this natural sphere argument. I'm going to read what he said in a private letter um, to Theodore Gibson in Great Falls, just a couple of paragraphs. The war bonnet has passed from the buck to the squaw, and soon the medicine pipe will follow. I recall reading a novel once entitled She, and in that wild tale the government was controlled by the women, and a woman will, will rule over all. This went on until the desperation of men who rose up and murdered the whole spread and started something new. I have no objection whatever to the ladies having on controlling a rightful portion of things, but to suddenly break through all lines of what I deem propriety rather jars my nerves. We have two women candidates for superintendent of public instruction, one on either ticket, and I'm rather glad of that. I've always believed them to be more efficient along those lines, more conscientious and faithful than the men, but then to make a sudden jump where they wish to sit where wars and the nation's troubles are passed upon, I think they're too fast. But I realize that I must belong to the Stone Age. Yet I'm rather glad that I've lived most of my life when I did. I feel sure that the beauties and niceties of the old times between men and women are nearing an end, 
And while I may be wrong, I am pronounced in my belief. They may be right, these women, but they are certainly taking something out of life that greatly and deeply affects us, it's my belief, and is closing paragraph. <laughs> The suffragettes do not understand my position, cannot feel what I feel, and I will go on reviling those who stand in my position until they have been ruined and perverted the whole of nature's, with a capital N, nature's plan regarding humans. Very typical expression of the time, and I think we're still in the job of going against what some people view as nature's um, perspective. And I would say that that so their argument was that women's nature was different from men's. We don't have a human nature here, but women are so different fundamentally, biologically, spiritually, that they are that their participation in public life is to be restricted for their protection, for the most part, and that men's was in the public sphere. That women couldn't handle issues of war, which is why Rankin also does it. And if you think that's gone away, I'll say in the end that the argument I've heard in the legislature, and we'll go through some of the statistics later, by one woman legislator was that women basically shouldn't run for the legislature while they have responsibilities for families. And think about Sarah Palin's comment about um, Mama Grizzly, that basically it's, an, it's a natural right, it's an argument around this issue of natural rights or special rights, that women's only real um, authority to participate in this public sphere is in that role, special responsibility as a mama grizzly. It's not her natural right as a citizen, it's a special right. And is that only that special right argument that in the end won suffrage? It is not the natural rights argument, which I would argue <coughs> we still have not come to grips with that. So that's going to underlie all of this discussion. So why does suffrage win in the West? Well, it starts in the East. You all know the 1848 um, Convention on Women's Rights in Seneca Falls. But it's only in the West, in this frontier environment, that suffrage takes hold. And the biggest reason for that, in many ways, is that when people came onto a frontier environment, there are all kinds of labor shortages. Women hold non-traditional jobs in much higher rates. If you're the only physician in hundreds of miles and you happen to be a woman, and they're going to live with it. Uh, in addition to that, particularly in eastern Montana, agricultural homesteaders in particular see women doing um, non-traditional jobs and working on the farm. They often called it helping out, but they're there. She may ride out side saddle, as Evelyn Cameron's photograph shows. She goes out and helps buck bales and load the hay on there, gets back on the horse and goes back to being a lady over here. But, she, but men realize that women's economic contribution to homesteading is critical for their economic survival, and they see them in a more direct way, as compared to, say, Butte or the mining communities where you have very sex-segregated jobs. Men are in the mines, women are doing domestic service and there's not the respect for women's work that you have in a frontier uh, rural environment. And that actually by historians is mostly credited for why suffrage is so much uh, stronger in the West and why when Montana passes uh, suffrage, it is Eastern Montana, it is Eastern Montana that votes for suffrage and narrowly does it, while Butte and Great Falls do not vote for it partly for these uh, gender issues and partly because suffrage comes along with the, with the prospect of prohibition. And these are the drinking towns, and they're not going to work for it. So, so it's, um, by 1920, when we have the National Suffrage Amendment that passes, 10 Western states have already voted for suffrage, including Montana. Or Montana. But suffrage had been around as a Montana issue for since uh, 1868, the founding of the territory. In fact, the wife of the fir, one of the first territorial governors, Mrs. James Ashley, came to Montana from Ohio, where she had been the president of the Ohio suffrage movement. Didn't get much traction here. Um, comes and goes off and on. And but in 1883, the Women's Christian Temperance Union is founded in Montana on the twin issues of suffrage and temperance. Um, must admit, my grandmother was a state president of Tampa, um, at WCTU. I was pledged as a temperance baby as a child. <laughs> <laughs> this devil sits on this one. <laughs> and the ballot was referred to as the home protection movement in the women's Christian temperance union. They have a very broad agenda of issues based in this Victorian rhetoric around the cult of true womanhood and women's moral superiority to men. And so their involvement is based, again, not in a natural rights argument, but in this women's special nature kind of uh, discussion. But they are very active and quite successful. Eventually, they have 202 local unions, they're called, across the state. Some towns have two or three of these. And they move issues such as getting women matrons in the jails, creating places for 
newspaper kids out on the street to go um, other than hang out in bars. They get opium and laudanum taken out of uh, patent medicines. They have a very broad social agenda in which they are largely quite successful. Suffrage is addressed in minor ways in the 1884 Montana Constitutional Convention. It's debated in almost every legislature. Uh, occasionally it passes one house or another. Women, in fact, do win the right to uh, vote in school elections, because again, it seems part of their special aptitude and nature for dealing with children, but they are not allowed to do things continually defeated on vote or, say, tax ballots and that sort of thing. Uh, leading suffragists speak before the legislature starting in the 1880s, including Ellen Knowles, who is a lobbyist for uh, suffrage. She's Montana's first um, woman attorney. She ran for attorney general in 1892 on the populist ticket, came in close second, populist for B, and then married the guy who won Haskell, so she had known to many people as Ellen Knowles Haskell. That marriage did not last long. <laughs> um, but all this political activity in, in Montana got the National American Women's Suffrage Association recognition of the West, and they send their first paid organizer to Montana in 1895, who works with state leaders, such as Harriet Saunders, who was the wife of the U.S. Uh, Senator Saunders. These, many of the women who lead this in this early area are the prominent women of Helena. They are Governor Fisk, Governor Edgerton's wives, daughters, etc. Now this is what um, Harriet Sanders said about what she thought the purpose of the ballot was. The ballot makes women better mothers. Better mothers created better homes and more enlightened children. Better homes and educated children improved the nation. Again, that's a special rights argument. That is not a natural rights argument of why women should be involved in uh, the ballot in politics. Suffrage interest fluctuates, but it really isn't until the getting closer to the teens when you have an influx of 10 million uh, immigrants coming into the United States, homesteading era that you start to see a lot of real change in uh, the West moving through um, securing suffrage in other states. 1910, it is uh, Washington that gets the ballot, and so the focus of the national suffrage movement comes to the West. The national suffrage organization sends one of its leading organizers from the state of Washington back to her home in Montana, and that woman is Jeanette Rankin. But when you think she just grew up here and suddenly, oh, but we'll do this, that's not the case. She was a very skilled organizer, highly trained, paid professional by the National American Women's Suffrage Association to return mm -hmm. back to Montana and take up the leadership of this initiative. So there's an intense four years of activity in Montana, and suffrage goes on the ballot in 1914. Very narrow victory, as again I said, the opposition is in the mighty towns, uh, primarily based on prohibition. But in those years, particularly those four years, you have Women who have really learned how to organize politically, they know how to speak publicly, they know how to raise money. You went to the historical society, you pulled out their reports, they're in triplicate, they say, who did I meet with, what was the ask, what did they say? I mean, they are really remarkably, you could take their models for organizing and use them today. They're, I mean, they're really good. Um, so all of that ability is now out there in the Montana community. These suffrage organizations, it's not just the Women's Christian Chapter and Union, the Montana Suffrage, uh, association. There are numerous men's and women's organizations that are supporting suffrage. So all these people are now politically activated. They just had a big win, so what do they do? They decide they're going to run. So Rankin isn't the only one here who decides to run. Um, you have uh, many other groups that are going to do it. Uh, and what's some of the other activity they come out of? Think of the other lobbying groups. In the capital, there are such things as um, the Legislative Council of Montana Women, which existed for 10 years during the teens, it had two full-time lobbyists. It ran into, it was the AAUW, the WCTU, and the largest organization at the time, the General Federation of Women's Clubs. They passed issues through the legislature that had everything to do with uh, making women persons under the law, such as giving women a special law so that she could start businesses in her own name and separate that piece of property away from her husband's that gave women a um, legal right to their own children. Big deal. They're very successful in those regards. So here's all these activists. So what are they going to do? They um, run for a whole set of offices. Rankin, of course, decides to run and is elected as the first woman to a national office anywhere in the world. Mae Trumper is elected to state superintendent of the schools. 
which remains an office that is held solely by women with one exception to this very day. Um, they elect two women to the legislature, Emma Engels, who's the owner of the inner leg in the Flathead, uh, a Republican, and uh, from Stevensville, Maggie Smith Hathaway, a Democrat, who serves in the legislature uh, for many years. In 1920, she is elected as uh, the Democratic uh, major minority leader. She's the first woman in the United States to hold a um, elected legislative office of that kind. She has a very long political career, including she ultimately starts what we now call the Department of Health and Human Services. Again, an agency mm -hmm. to deal with mothers and their children, in prim primarily. Um, and actually, there's a wonderful out of print book. The reason there's no list for you to read because you can't find it. It's called Maggie from Montana. Some of you remember Professor Harold Hasher from the university wrote this fabulous little book about Maggie Smith Hathaway. Um, in addition, Helen Clark was elected to a local office. She's from Helena. She's began, and uh, she's elected as superintendent of public instruction for Lucy Clark County. So across the board, women who have had all this political experience take it to the next level, <coughs> run and serve in elected office because of the movement. So once they get the vote, what happens? Well, we hit World War I, and then we hit a depression. Things such as the uh, Equal suffrage clubs become good government clubs, become the League of Women Voters, and work on the Equal Rights Amendment. For the most part, the rest of the movement that underpins all of this just kind of evaporates for um, all intents and purposes. And you don't really see it surface again until um, the 1970s. Uh, but I do want to mention one person in the interim that I think you should know about. The first woman I ever met who was an elected official was up on Fort Peck Reservation where I grew up. Um, Dolly Akers, who was a legislator in the 1940s in Montana. She's the first Native American um, to be elected in Montana. She was extremely prominent in state politics with Governor Ford and very involved nationally in leadership positions and in the founding of the Congress of American Indians. Um, and she was, I, I was born in West Virginia. Uh, so I'm going to jump now to the 1970s, and again, the roots of the life we know of political life is really in the 70s and in this modern political era. And I think it's very hard to understand the importance of that time unless you think about it in the context of the political movements of the day. As I'm going to say, nobody does this on their own. None of us got elected on our own. None of you who serve in various ways do it because you're such an exceptional person. Jeanette Reagan didn't get elected because she was such an exceptional person. They get elected and get involved because there is a mass movement and a cultural change in the values that says that these are our obligations and our rights to participate in life. That's the truth of the matter. It's still the truth of the matter. Um, so it is that activism that makes the difference. What was going on in the early 70s? Well, you have the civil rights movement, the student activism movement, the free speech movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, all of those things going on at the same time because they go together. They all come out of the same value structure around social justice and political activism, the challenging of the systems of the day. Well, so what has that got to do with women in Montana politics? Everything, because the Montana Constitution and the Constitutional Convention in 71 comes out of that environment. And how does it happen? I mean, the Constitution was a mess at that point, and you really got to go in and and we look at how government's structured anyway, periodically, and there was sort of a spate of them happening at this time. I still give almost, I give enormous credit to the League of Women Voters for actually making the Constitutional Convention happen. Without them, I have no doubt it would never have succeeded. It wouldn't have happened in the first place, it would never have passed, and we would not have the modern Constitution that we have. What did they do? Um, the League, you know, these were women in that day and age who started around the line of UCA. They were uh, educated women, um, mostly white, quite educated, had had professional jobs, got married, but no longer, were, most of them were not in the paid workforce, but they considered their work and their obligation to do public service in these roles of uh, community leadership and in the role of the League. And the League's job was to get people politically involved in the process. It wasn't to move a women's agenda, as you would think of it, it was to move uh, looking at the public process of politics and so forth. So these women had worked together for decades and knew each other very well when they decided that there needed to be a constitutional convention. Lucille Spear, some of you may have remembered her, who was over at the university, 
uh, worked at the university, had not married, actually wrote, researched and wrote a pamphlet on how to organize a constitutional convention. So the League studied it, you know, in the way the League studies something for a couple of years, so they were all on board with this. So they um, then organized for the legislature and got uh, one called. Now, they set up the constitutional convention as 100 delegates. They ran from places like here, but not on a partisan basis. And so a number of these women ran and were elected. Of the 100 delegates, 19 were women. And what I think is most stunning about it is 16 of them were very deeply embedded in the League of Women Voters and the AUW for the most part. And they're all in the urban areas. There's a few that aren't, but they're really more out in the rural areas. So these are women who are coming in in an organized way into the Constitutional Convention, know each other well, trust each other, and have an agenda. And they set up the Constitutional Convention. So let me tell you about just a couple of them briefly. And they have many of the leadership roles. The youngest member is Maine Ann Robinson Ellingson, 19 at the time, serves on the committee that drafts the preamble of the Constitution. Um, many of you know uh, Maine Ann. We have an express right to privacy. Louise Cross from Glendive chaired the committee that dealt with the environment and wrote those provisions that provide for a clean and healthful environment. Uh, Bozeman's Dorothy Eck added the Indian Education for All provision to the education section uh, based on the request from two students from Fort Peck. There are no Native American delegates in the convention. Um, and I could go on. There are many, many others. In the end, the Constitution, which was signed by all 100 delegates, uh, really reflected all of the sort of liberal values of that time. And I'm quite sure we could not pass it today. It barely passed then. And I would assert that without the vote of women and the activism of these women, it would not have passed. So most of the men delegates returned to their jobs. They had jobs. but um, and, they, and the convention put aside a little bit of money for actually uh, campaigning. And then they had a court ruling saying they couldn't spend it that way. So these women, who had already organized the Con Con and served in it, then raised the money. And they were the ones who went out on the road to promote the passage of this. They raised money to publicize it, and they traveled with it. What I found most interesting is Dorothy Eck told, told me a fascinating story about Betty Babcock. Go back to this idea, think again about women in the private sphere. Betty was a Con Con delegate, later a legislator, but at the time she was married to our then governor, Tim Babcock, who opposed the new constitution. Well, they were having uh, an event over at the, <coughs> over at the uh, mansion, and the governor was there with some of his friends, and they were talking about how they were going to defeat the Constitution. Guess who was standing there serving coffee and tea? Betty. You know, they never even paid any attention to her whatsoever. She was completely invisible. But that conversation made her so mad, she decided to devote all of her time to the passage of the Constitution. <laughs> she hit the road. She was out there traveling everywhere, raising money. I mean, really, probably without Betty Babcock, it would not have happened. Mm -hmm. But so I really credit and think that we should all recognize the role of those women, not just as individuals, but particularly the role of the League in securing the Constitution as we now know it. So after passage of that, of course, here's another group of women who have all these skills and talents, and many of them decide to run, and many of them do hold an elective office. The biggest things that happened after the um, Constitution was in terms of service in the legislature, we went from having a handful of women, 10, 15 at the most, um, up to um, starting to have closer to what we have now, um, which is about 23%. The implementation of the Constitution requires such things as removing gender references from the Constitution, or from all of the codes. So there's a committee that degenderizes. it. So we don't see things that just refer to he. Um, there's a number of things there. And I could go on about that, but I think I'll skip to the more uh, recent topic of what's happened, because um, I want to have time to talk about this. So where are we today? Well, have we achieved parity? Are we fully reflected in our political life? What do you think? No. <laughs> <coughs> and, but, you know, we've come a long way, so I think it's been worth it, and we've made a lot of change. When I first entered the elected political realm, before that I was a radical and didn't want anything to do with elected politics, I thought it was corrupt. Then I found out that basically people lived and died based on it, and thought, well, maybe one should pay attention to it. So when I first went over to the Capitol in the mid 70s working as a lobbyist on reproductive rights, it was an interesting time. At that point, there was only one statewide elected uh, woman, the superintendent of public instruction. There were about a dozen legislators. In fact, Anne Marie Dusso was the majority leader in the House at the time. And I was one of 
three women full-time lobbyists up there, which I think is just a hoot. Carla Gray was working for the Montana Power Company. Janelle Fallon was working for the Farm Bureau. There were some women up there that were kind of what we always called eye candy that the company would bring out to entertain <laughs> men. Um, but there were very few serious lobbyists. And there were some, you know, the league had come in and out, things like that. In terms of being up there all the time, there really were only three of us. And that has definitely changed, which you can, I think you all know. There are as many women, probably not as many, and not as well paid, but there are certainly many, many women lobbying for every possible issue up there, as well as on behalf of women's issues. You know, the women's lobbies up there, the um, Montana Women Vote, individual groups. Uh, we've now formed a Democratic uh, Women Legislators Caucus. So there is a presence sort of throughout that body. Now, what about the U.S. Senate? Do we have any women that have been elected? Never. Congress? Not for 70 years since Jeanette Rankin was elected. Uh, one governor, Martz in 97, no lieutenant governor. Other statewide offices, so this is sort of a status update. Superintendent of Public Instruction, as I said, since 1918. It's always been women except for Ed Argenbright. Uh, now we have Denise Juno, who's not only a female, of course, but the first Native American to hold that office and to hold a statewide office um, nationwide. Andrea Bennett, a uh, Republican from Great Falls, uh, ran and served in 85 while she was first a legislator as state auditor, and now we have Monica Lindy. We've never had a woman as Attorney General. Linda McCullough is the first woman to serve as Secretary of State. In terms of the Public Service Commission, we've only had one ever, and that's Gail Lucci. I don't think we've had another. Um, Supreme Court. Carla Gray was Chief Justice, and we currently have two women on the court. Actually, the story with Carla is always kind of interesting because one of the early bills the women's lobby got passed was to require uh, gender balance in appointments to boards and commissions by the governor, and that was a big topic at the point where Carla had applied to be appointed Chief Justice by Governor Stevens. It, it was in play, it was a very big deal, and I remember after it happened. The governor said, well, are you happy now? <laughs> yes, I am. <don't>, thank you. <laughs> you know, so pressure, saying, you know, these, these institutions should reflect women is important, and it does matter, and it does make a difference. The legislature, currently, um, in the Montana Senate, 16% are women. Two Republicans out of 28, actually it was only one Republican woman for years, Avin Curtis, and now there are two. Uh, on the Democratic side, six of the 22, including um, Minority Leader Carol Williams. In the House, 28% are women. So there are more women in the House than in the Senate. Of the Republicans, 68. They have 68 seats. Nine of them are women. But over on the Democratic side, something totally new happened this time, which is we only had 32 seats, but for the first time, the majority of those seats were held by women. 19 uh, women out of 32. Um, and we jokingly said to the guys, we'll let you have half the seats. I mean, you know we've got more, this, more <laughs> holding more seats, but you know, we'll share with you. <laughs> um, we had four women of color in the House and Senate. Three of those are Native American, one is Hispanic. Uh, we have had more women in the legislature than we currently have, uh, 95 and 97 and one or two. But basically, I would say, even though we now have five times more women in the House and Senate than we had in 1950, 1971, to me, it still feels like we're pretty much stuck at this having about 23, 24% of the legislature, and we've kind of maintained at that level. So we're nowhere near 50%. And one time, I think, um, the Center for Women in Politics, which is out of Rutgers, had estimated at this rate it would be 300 years before we got to gender parity, and frankly, that's not good enough for me. The national average is 24%. That's about what Montana's currently is. Colorado leads the country as most of the West does, Colorado leads with having 41% of their legislature. Um, it's interesting to kind of reflect on it. I mean, I don't think this issue is particularly partisan. You look back to that history, you've got lots of Republicans as well as Democrats holding these different seats. But at the moment, it is interesting that, I mean, the Republican Senate guys would talk to me about how kind of embarrassed they were that there weren't any women over on their side because I helped them. It's like, well, <laughs> because if you look at the numbers still, it's like three times as many Democrats, uh, women are Democrats than are Republicans. So what's going on underneath that that needs to be looked at? And I think it is that story I related about the discussion of there still are parties within the Republican Party, not everyone, who do think that this is not really women's role uh, to be there. In the, so it takes a lot more guts in some ways to be out there and get elected if you're a Republican than a Democrat.
And then that comment of Sarah Palin's I still find fascinating. Those of us in the West know, Mama Grizzlies eat their young. And, you know, they're single mothers on top of it. So I think it's kind of an interesting analogy. <laughs> but it works. And it's, and, but it creates a philosophical base for women to enter politics. And that's what I say from all of this. You don't enter this just because you suddenly decided you're interested in politics. Philosophically, you have to stand somewhere. And history gives you that place to stand. What is the your um, understanding of a citizen's responsibility to participate in government. How is it you view the general role of women? Those are the things that create a platform philosophically for you to stand on when you run for public office and serve in public office. And what I'm saying is I think there's an emergent argument about that again, particularly as some parts of the Republican Party view that argument is quite different than how I would say many of the people who run as Democrats do that at this point. It's not that they won't come back together again, but that's kind of where they're at. Um, again, um, this one may shock you, but nationally, uh, men hold a whopping 83% of all the seats in Congress. But they're not that different than state legislatures, where they hold a whopping 76% of all the seats. So those clearly do not reflect uh, women as the majority of voters or um, as a uh, percentage of the populace. And that's why I would argue that we have a very long way and a lot of work to do to move women into these offices. So how do you do that? I mean, there are various studies on how you get to this point. What are the feeder systems to get women to run for office? One of the most important is appointments to boards and commissions, which is why we took that up legislatively some years ago. Before we address that legislatively in terms of racial parity and gender equity, um, you saw some of the hundreds of boards that were in state government. You know, the ones that had to do with kids, very heavily women, or maybe all women, the ones that had to do with a coal tax or uh, fish, wildlife, and parks were pretty much all men. And then there'd be some that were mixed. So by analyzing that and, and requiring them to be gender balanced to the degree possible, we've started to see a lot uh, greater shift in uh, gender balance and racial parity on those boards. And both governors, uh, Republican and Democrat, have been quite good about trying to address that in a pretty systematic kind of way. But again, you have to apply for those. It's like running for office. It's not like, well, if I do a wonderful job out here, someone will notice it and Helena and call me up and say, Diane, we could just love to serve our next committee. If you want to be on a committee, it's your job to step up and apply for it, get your information in, and campaign for it. That's how it works. And uh, uh, women have done that uh, in greater and greater numbers forever. The other, I think, real problem is uh, the difficulty of leaving children still exists. Primarily women of childbearing age are still responsible for uh, minor children. Um, men do still legislatively leave their wives and their children at home and serve in the legislature. And women just do not do that. And more do I think they should do that. I mean, the time period is short to be with your children. And childcare would not solve that problem because you would not see that child anyway from seven in the morning till seven at night. Is that better? You can haul a kid out of school and put him in Helena where they're really all alone and abandoned. That doesn't work either. So there really isn't a terribly good solution to that problem, I don't think, at this point. But it is a reality that men and women approach their children differently um, and their families as they serve in the legislature. For all of you who think it's only women who are elected or lobbyists who affect um, legislation, I should refer to you to the legislative spouses group. There are many legislators who bring their spouses, a few men, but mostly wives, who are sitting there every day up there and watching all the action, and they have opinions, and trust me, they get expressed. And they do impact um, legislation and public policy in that role as well. So, I think we have a lot to do and a lot to think about to get ready for the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage and thinking about what it means and where we go with that. Um, so I'm going to end by just saying that, so whatever your role is, whether you are a uh, just a voter, and thank God if you're voting, um, because not everybody does it, um, an activist on an issue, whatever that might be, uh, a public servant who serves on the board of commission, a student thinking about what all this means, or someone who's either a candidate or an elected official, you are the part of a living chain that connects these people going back to um, well over 100 years who have continued to advocate for and think about the role of women in public life and to advocate for expanding that. So you're part of this living chain of history. And I have found it to be enormously 
comforting and inspiring, particularly at the most difficult points of votes as an elected official, to remember what that uh, experience has been and what that responsibility is. And people have gone before us and fought many of these battles. And when you get frustrated, you think things aren't changing fast enough. Remember, it took 72 years for women to win suffrage. 72 years. Generations of women died, and their daughters and granddaughters picked it up. And that was true in Montana. The women that I told you about in the beginning who argued for suffrage were dead before um, the suffrage, the new suffrage movement in, say, 1910 picked up and then won suffrage. These things sometimes take generations. So um, that's not to say that you should slow down and just wait for something to happen. You have to make it happen. But you are part of that legacy. We are all part of that legacy. And it is an important one and one that will sustain you. So wherever you are, pick up your part of the chain and let's keep moving it forward. And if you would like to be involved in some of the centennial activities, I don't know yet what they're all going to be. We've got a little bit of a committee across the state. I'm most pleased to say that the legislature did agree we did to um, create a mural of women's uh, participation mm -hmm. in Montana's community life to go into the Capitol and put on that place. There are very few pictures in the Capitol. Uh, we've got a couple of Sacagawea, Sacagawea, but pretty much that's it. There's not much in there. So I'm very much looking forward to that and serving on the committee to make sure that that happens and that we are hoping to have that unveiled in 2014, which will be a nice, I think, tribute. There is a problem with planting the tree. Um, so we're going to need your help, but we'll, we'll, I assume, have many conferences, local programs, speakers, bureaus, and various things to uh, both celebrate and to figure out how to move that history, use the history to move us forward. So with that, I would open it up to questions. What do you want to know? Okay. Yes? I was interested in what you said about your Republican colleague asking what you can do to make it seem that there are mm -hmm. women participating on the Republican side of the aisle. Mm -hmm. So is he just an outlier, or what's going on with this <laughs> the candy floss um, Republican Women pre representation at, in the you know executive from Marx to Bachman, it's like none of them are serious. Are they hoping that it's going to self destruct? I would say the Republican women in the legislature are very serious. There's no fluff in there at all. So how come mm -hmm. they can't get up to the to the higher levels of representation? Of the executive? Well, I think there are very serious Republican women across the country who hold various offices. There are many of them. You know, there. If you want to talk about people who, have, you know, years ago I used to say, "Huh, well, no one were actually successful in the legislature when we have women serving who are lightweights to the percentage that we have men who are lightweights in politics." And there are, you know, there are plenty of men in the legislature. I don't want to give you a list of names who are basically kind of lightweights, and they're fine. But and there are women like that too. But um, I think it's not fair to judge uh, the women of either party as being. Lightweights or candy floss. That's not true. Well, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is the ones that get a lot of that are high profile, like Michelle Bach or Judy Marks, are all just easily dismissed as compared to, say, Hillary Clinton, for one example. Who was quite easily dismissed, I might point out, I think. Did you think so? Mm -hmm. Those arguments about women's nature are women tough enough to go to war, or women tough enough to do X, Y, or Z are still there in all of those. Oh yeah, you know, the discussion about, oh, she's just about <laughs> criticizing women about baking cookies, what's right, and even now the discussion's all about her hairdo. I mean, give me a break. Um, you know, so I'm, I think that kind of criticism from people goes across the board to, to many women, unfairly. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there aren't some people who deserve criticism for stupid comments, but um, for the most part, I think, women who hold office, regardless of party, are, are owed respect for doing it. It's a tough job. It's a tough job. And that's my question. Can you tell us what it's like being a legislator? Because I think most women look at politics mm -hmm. in the legislature and don't want any part of it. I think that's true. I think that's why particularly this time around you're having a harder time recruiting people as the level of conflict there. And I love the legislature. I mean, after 30 some <laughs> years, primarily as a lobbyist and being turned out. You know, it is a very interesting place to learn about any issue you want, but the process does predominantly deal with conflict. And I think it is um, misleading to people to say, um, uh, or it's just dirty politics. The political arena, particularly like the legislature, is where you actually invite in conflict. 
And I think we should try to reframe how we look at that. That's a good thing. This is the place we invite it to come in its fullness, in its full disagreement, and then discuss it and debate it. You win, you lose, you know, depending on whatever. But that is where we have that discussion, and we should do it more civilly. But it is certainly better than shooting each other out on the streets. Now, learning how to handle that conflict, I think, is one of the best things politics offers women, and women offer politics, because there are many ways to deal with conflict. I mean, po politics is sort of simple in one way, because you got the votes, you got the votes, you don't, you don't. But, but the part of it that has to do with persuading people about positions and moving people are things women generally are fairly good at in us and have sort of a sophisticated array of strategies for, I mean, God, if you got to convince kids to go to bed and eat their spinach or whatever and your husband and blah, 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 you sure as hell can take on the legislature and, and understand <laughs> the subtleties of how you have to convince people to do something. That it's not about standing up and blustering and saying blah, 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 blah. It's far more about my spending time meeting one-on-one -on -one with so-and-so and just listening to them and hearing what they say and then trying to respond to that and being human and finding out why it is do they think that and what are the arguments to move that. That kind of respectful discussion I think women are quite good at. Um, not all of them, but mostly because of having to deal with it in different environments, women learn to do that in a different way than men learn to do it. And so both of those together actually are quite helpful. But I think the conflict thing is one of the reasons women are most reluctant to take on the legislature. But um, I think it's one of the great strengths of the legislature and a wonderful, you know, when people say, God, last session must have been terrible. Well, actually, I thought it was great in the, in the way that our job is to go, my job is to go there and represent my folks, my platform, my position. We stand up every day and talk about what we believe in. We work and negotiate and educate about issues. We win some, we lose some. My job is not always to win. It is, I'm a representative. It doesn't mean I always win. They have the votes. They have 68 votes. We have 32. Mm -hmm. That number's there from day one. That vote was cast in November. <clears throat> but my job is to make sure our arguments get out on the floor, get heard, get on the record, Kill some bills, modify some others, governor vetoed a whole bunch of them. But that's your job, is to speak, to speak for your folks and to and do that work. Does not mean you won't lose win. You're gonna lose even even if you're in the majority, you're gonna lose. And you're gonna lose a lot. So get used to it. That's not what it's about. But I think it's a fabulous process and I think everyone should serve in public elected office. It's both an honor, it's a challenge, it's the best learning place in the world. So, oh, you stated that uh, 10 states passed uh, suffrage laws yep. before it was approached mm -hmm. on a national level, which I find very interesting. So I was wondering, do you find that to be a model for large or slash radical social change? I don't think it's for radical change. It's just the way change happens. The federal level never changes before the states and local levels do. Almost never. It's partly why... The Roe v. Wade thing has always been so politically cantankerous, and always because it never got resolved at state level prior to that. But because things like that that have to go out for ratification on the ballot have to have constituencies in all the states to do it. In fact, the story I will tell you about ratification of uh, suffrage that I find such a wonderful one is, and the importance of the single vote is that uh, when the amendment went to the states for ratification. Um, it had been through all the, sta all the states but one that could vote for it, and that last one was Tennessee. And in Tennessee, there was a huge battle because it was going to be very close. So if you were, um, a sunflower was for the suffrage people, and the red rose was for the people who were opposed to suffrage. And it looked like it was going to go down, and the vote was coming up that day. And um, there was one young man who uh, was on the record as going to vote against suffrage. His mother called him up, she was already up there, and she begged him to change his vote and vote for suffrage, and he did. And therefore, it passed in Tennessee, and it became the federal amendment to the Constitution because of that one mother and that one son. Yeah. So, there are, I mean, it's odd that this one's every time I tell that story. I mean, it's an interesting story for a lot of reasons, the power of one vote, but how narrowly we came to not having suffrage. And the high price that was paid in many places in lives spent moving these issues forward. So 
an answer to yours. It takes a groundswell. You know what you hear from the Supreme Court now, what one of the more recent ones, say gay marriage issues. You know, that changes at the federal level after it has already changed in the public mind. And I'll tell you, rarely does legislation need it be followed. We need to be called leaders, but in fact, we try to reflect the will of the people, such as it is. I mean, occasionally you get out there on something, but overall, things don't change legislatively at the state or the federal level unless it really reflects much more closely the will of the majority of the people. And so that's where, whatever the issue is, without that agitation at the local level by activists, passing local ordinances, whatever it might be, petitions, whatever, and it can take decades. Until that happens, I can guarantee you nothing's going to happen at the federal level on any issue. I have to tell, yes, Connie. I have to tell a little story about Diane. So I'm a for the East River Market about um, legislation that I helped with Jeanette Rankin's statute. And so <clears throat> then it turned, was turned over to the Montana Arts Council. And all of a sudden, we were a clack of women. We were written out. Mm -hmm. uh, we were sent home. Mm -hmm. So we got Joan Jonko, who wrote a four page lawyer letter. The Montana Arts Council says you're going to get sued if you do not, not only represent this, of that and take the, you know, the spirit of the law as well as uh, the gist of it, mm -hmm. you know, but it had to be the spirit too. So I put together a four-page, um, I guess an eight-page booklet to take to the lunch and back there you see. And um, I took it to Diane, and she said, well, who, who put this together? Who edited this? And I said, I did. And she said, well, then put down there, Connie Stelz, an editor. Well, you know, we have such a, we just have such a feeling of inferiority. That when somebody says something like that, it takes you a bath. Well, to follow up on that story, getting the Rankin statue in the Statuary Hall of D.C. here was quite a challenge because uh, Jeanette Rankin's sister-in-law, um, mm -hmm. Louise Gall, married to Wellington Rankin, totally opposed any discussion of Jeanette Rankin, either as a peace activist or her stuff on suffrage. Pretty hard to talk about Jeanette if you're not going to talk about those things. And she and they were all deferring to her. Well, I kind of broke her the deal, and the only thing I really like is they've never written about Jeanette Rankin. Or a two-part article was written in the Montana Magazine of Western History back in the 70s or 80s by Joan Hoff Wilson, who was president of the Organization of American Historians, and she's from U. And um, so since she was the president of the Organization of American Historians, they all thought she'd be fine to give a talk about Jeanette. And of course, she talked about all of those things. So, and she looked down the and stuff. But, you know, even then, to get rank and recognized for what she had done as her part of it, I think is important. But again, you know, sometimes we use Rankin in a way that I think disempowers women. You know, she is, she was quite good as an organizer. She was terrible. She never wrote anything. Bell Winston's ghost wrote everything that ever came out. Um, but she was a great organizer. But she's not a person who singularly won that. And when we teach about Rankin in that way as being this singular hero up on a pedestal, I think it does not help us. In fact, it disempowers us to understand the dynamic of what it takes to create social change. And then everybody plays their role in that. So, other questions, comments? Yes. The woman you said, um, Knowles, that married no. Castle, mm -hmm. she was a lawyer, you said, right? Self-taught. Well, the way they learned law at that time was you apprenticed yourself to a lawyer. Oh, okay. She came back east and she apprenticed herself to a lawyer and then took the bar and became an attorney. And when she ran, the populists were a very popular third party at the time. And so, well, they didn't win a ton of seats, they did win some. So she came fairly close to winning. And then um, she was appointed deputy attorney general and Mary Haskell, and that person, Haskell, but she was also head of the state uh, suffrage organization in the 1880s. And the debate was, could a woman run for office if, women, if she couldn't vote? She could not vote for herself. Mm -hmm. Only men could vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Well, with that, it's 1 o'clock. I don't want to keep you past then. I sure appreciate all of you coming, and I think you should have